that's probably the highest currency <laughs> is, is how creative one is. Uh, and by creative, I mean seeing things in different ways or in new ways that are not taking the path of other people. And so this is where it is the highest premium is, is to, so you help start new things or new ways of looking at things or finding new solutions to old problems. Asking the right question, that can lead to lots of different paths. And one of them is creativity because being creative is an interesting question. First, it's hard to quantify, but it, it, there's two ways I think about at least trying to be creative in the type of science I execute. So one way to do it is if you, it's very mechanical. So you can start off saying, where does something exist in society now? And what is that benchmark? And then find out the weakness. So say, for instance, with energy, our energy is carbon-based. That's a weakness. And then what you start doing is working backwards. And what I always do is work backwards, ask the right question up front. So for instance, could I use the sun? Could I use the sun and water? for instance, and split water to make hydrogen and oxygen. That's one way to store solar energy. And then as I ask that question, I start working backwards to find out, is there a fundamental science question that if I could answer would really advance the field of that first question I asked by working backwards. Creativity is enormously important for a scientist. Um, what is so interesting to me about science is the close connection, for example, which not everybody appreciates between um, artistic creativity and scientific creativity. I believe they're very related. And um, uh, a, a creative scientist is able to think in a way that is different from others and that has their own, almost a signature, if you like, if I go to a, a museum and I look at certain kinds of paintings, um, you, it, I can almost immediately pick out a particular artist and recognize their style. And if I read the work of an outstanding scientist, I can immediately see this person has a style, just like an artist. That, and they developed it over time. It's how they ask and answer questions. They have their own way of doing it. Of course, all scientists are following a similar method, um, but the way in which they do it is their own. And um, so just as an artist will develop a style, so will a scientist. And that style emerges over time uh, by practicing by succeeding and failing and by developing it. Um, so I think there's a deeply creative part of being a scientist and it's one of the great joys of being a scientist is to experience that creativity. The other way, and this is kind of strange to say, but when you're very deep and in the rabbit hole, like I say, and you're really focusing on something, it's almost strange, but af after a while, the science begins talking to you. So like if I'm doing an experiment, my students do are doing an experiment, the experiment is talking to you. It's giving you a result. And all of a sudden, in, like even now, I get goosebumps thinking about it. My skin gets goosebumps. Because all of a sudden, it's as, as if the experiment is talking to you, holding your hand taking you down a path. And you don't really have to think hard. You have to be observant and you have to listen carefully to the experiment. But when that happens and the science begins speaking to you, uh, you can get very creative. You're, all of a sudden, you don't even realize the path. You didn't see it before. But I'll, as the science appears, you start to see, I need to walk down this road. And it's a road maybe nobody else has walked down before.
uh, I think that you do train it in the same way. Again, I would say it's analogous to the way a, a, an artist will do will, will develop it, but it is within certain. It's within a framework, but within that framework, there's so much possibility for how to express yourself as a scientist, to have your own way of thinking and your own personality show up in your science. And you can see this, of course, very clearly in the really great scientists. And I'm thinking, of course, if you think about a, uh, an Einstein or a Newton and you look at them as um, their work, you can see inside it a way of thinking that each one had that expressed their character in such interesting and deep creative ways. So yeah, I think science is very creative and each of us learns, if you are a scientist, how to develop your own um, creative style. Well, you can say actually it starts in elementary school when you ask a child, what do you think of this? But in science, uh, it's not trained by giving them a textbook and say, learn about what's in the textbook, do the problems in the back, and you'll be tested on similar problems like in the back of the textbook. That does not train creativity. In fact, it stamps it out. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the way it's trained at this higher level is in research groups and you're sitting with a more senior scientist, let's say the professor who runs a research group, and in group meetings you're discussing problems, you're discussing how to solve problems, and everybody gets to talk. The professor's, a good professor is not saying, well, do what I asked you to do, uh, and that's it. They actually, I actually try very much to get them to come up with own ideas, we teach ourselves, each other, collectively, when you go into something new, uh, how you even read someone else's research paper and try to understand uh, it from a very fundamental way. Is it correct? Uh, a lot of research is not initially 100% correct, but that whole process is something, it's like an apprentice mode. and and. You know, in part, I learned how to do it when I was a graduate student in the same way. And it's not an accident that very good scientists quite often have students and postdocs who also become very good scientists. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this personal way of showing this is how it's done that does not appear in textbooks.